Hey everyone, Zach Stein at Carbon Collective here, and what I want to walk you through today is this amazing report that Project Drawdown, our heroes, the group that publishes the list of the top 100 climate solutions, we have the technology today that we need to solve climate change, and what they came out with is this report, Climate Solutions at Work. And what the goal of this report is, is to enable employees, potentially like you, and then investment companies like us to say, what does it mean for a major corporation or a minor one to align itself with solving climate change? And so in this video, what I want to do is I want to dig in and break it down. There's a total of eight categories, eight categories. And so let's break it down together and go category by category. So you either as an employee or as an investor or as someone who's related to this can see what will it take for your company to transition and fully align itself with solving climate change because we have to go as quickly as possible. So the first thing that has to happen, the number one thing here is emissions reductions. And this is pretty basic. When we look at carbon emissions, the thing that needs to happen this decade in the 2030s for us to be on a path to avoid catastrophic climate change is we have to turn off the tap. Uh, this the analogy of a bathtub or a sink is often used in these spaces, and it's just because it makes a lot of sense. Um, in nature, it is that carbon gets released. When a tree dies and falls down in the forest, um, as the carbon that was stored in that trunk, as it rots um, and breaks down the and gets broken down by microbes, the carbon in that gets released back into the atmosphere. This is the normal carbon cycle. That carbon that gets reuptaken by the trees that use its nutrients to grow in its place. So that's where you have kind of a normal carbon cycle and where we have this drain here, which is natural land and ocean carbon sink. So there is a drain here. The problem with climate change is that because of humans, we've been digging up all of this past stored carbon in fossil fuels and oil, gas, and coal, and then burning it. So we've been emitting far, far more. We've been filling the tub much faster. So in order to be on a path to solve climate change, we could install as many solar panels as we want. But if we don't fundamentally turn off this tap, the bathtub's just going to continue to fill, and the natural carbon cycles and even potentially human cycles won't be enough in order to drain the bathtub fast enough. So that's what as companies, as you can do. And so what should a company do? There are three types of emissions that a company has. There's scope one. So this is the direct emissions from sources owned or controlled by a company. So this is like the vehicles and facilities and things like that. Scope two is upstream. So it's like the electricity and heating and cooling and stuff you're used. So a factory that's going to purchase a bunch of electricity is going to have much higher scope two than like an uh, insurance broker that just has an office. Um, and then scope three, this is much harder to measure, but we'll see in a sec is by far the biggest. This is all of the indirect emissions. So including the extraction and production of purchased materials and fuels um, and vehicles not owned by the company, business travel, all of that. And so scope three is by far the biggest piece um, of this. And so how can, should you as a company, how, how do you approach uh, reducing emissions? So the first thing is to set goals. This is so important, including interim targets, not just a, we're gonna be net zero by 2050 because like that's a really long time away. What are the interim goals in an actual path to get there? And how is it not just overly relying on carbon offsets, which are a way of you know attempting to be a drain, but actually are shutting down and reducing the flow of carbon in here. That is so important in this. Number two. Um, use carbon removal technology as a last result, resort. So there are some emissions that are truly uh, unavoidable right now, like flying. We just don't have an alternative to jet engines that does not burn fossil fuels. There's potentially fuels that could be used that would be um, have far less lifetime emissions, but still. Uh, but for most industries, that you can avoid those emissions. So um, this kind of over-reliance of like, well, we'll figure out how to drain it all later. We're going to keep filling the bathtub. No, no, no. We got to turn off the drain. Address full supply chain and historical emissions. This is so important. This is especially if you work at a major corporation. I mean, for major corporations in general, the ability for them to look at their whole supply chain and say like, hey, you know, random factory somewhere, we buy like 50% of the stuff that you make. And so if you lose us as a customer, that's going to be a really big deal. We need to work together to improve your sustainability and the sourcing of where your raw materials are from in all of those pieces as well, including then the historical emissions um, from those products uh, as well. And that's where something that you can have that reduction, but where offsets can also really come in and play a piece. 
institutionalized emission reductions uh, efforts. So this is that you shouldn't just have a sustainability team who's kind of like on the outside, banging on the wall saying, hey, we should do this. But how do you do this across the company? And that's why setting those goals are so important. Um, And then the final thing is embed climate justice. There is... We are at this uh, inflection point where there's going to be a lot of opportunity, um, and a lot, but also a lot of chance to repair uh, past harms. And so it's so important that in making these solutions and embedding these solutions for solving climate change, that it's not just a way for the wealthy to get wealthier, but that it is making our world greener, safer, and healthier for everyone. Number two is stakeholder engagement and collaboration. So there are a lot of stakeholders involved in a company. And if you're an employee, you're one of them. This is something that as a company, you might want to get ahead of. Uh, we're seeing already that companies are, the employees at companies are placing increased pressure on their companies to make these changes. How can you make yourself a more attractive place to work? By taking these types of changes and engaging employees. So this could be both on how do we at work in, let employ have employees have power and say in terms of the climate impact, but also how do you help them at home? How can you offer perks? There's more companies that are enabling that. Um, create pathways for every job to be a climate job. So here, this is like it's again pushing back on the climate is just the role of sustainability. The sustainability team. It's no. In order for us to solve climate change, every company, especially major companies, have to align entirely around this change. So they use the example here of accountants. So you could focus also on the ways to align financial resources with the company's climate change goals or cafeteria workers, the people who are purchasing the food and cooking it. How are they aligning what they're doing with things like regenerative agriculture? Um, The board needs to have climate competent people. This is especially when you're trying to reach um, goals for emissions reductions. It's really important for that and then uh, partner with and engage uh, communities for local benefits. So companies exist in places, they will sometimes extract resources um, and not necessarily put them back. And so how can companies be engaging, you know, the water bottling company that is taking a lot of resources from the local watershed, how could they be re-engaging and putting some of those profits into repairing that watershed and helping the people who live there as well? Number three, products, partnership, and procurement, the three Ps. So this is super important. Um, The first part of it is how can your company not be working with some of the worst actors here? So one of the best ways that we can get the fossil fuel industry to change is by cutting off their resources to some of the best services in the world. So if you work for Amazon, that how could you pressure Amazon to not allow its AWS services to uh, help fossil fuel giants find better, find fossil fuels more cheaply. And there's a lot of examples of that. And how can you push internally to be very selective with the types of customers that that company is willing to work with? Similarly, um, and we talked about this earlier, how can you as a company, especially if you're purchasing a lot of materials, either raw materials or manufactured materials, how do you make sure that your suppliers are adopting those science-based targets and holding them to it and potentially even investing in helping them get there? Um, Similarly with that, how do you help your suppliers and also in the design of your products, prioritize using things that can be recycled and reused and and low carbon materials. There's a lot of opportunity, especially for better marketing with that type of thing as well. So it's something that can really pay for itself. All right, now we're stepping into our wheelhouse a little bit here, investments and financing. So this graph is one of the most impactful graphs to us in all of climate change graphs. Basically what it says, is that according to Project Drawdown, the number one blocker from solving climate change is investments. In 2019, $615 billion was invested in climate solutions. Like, that's awesome. It's a lot. It's, you know, basically double from 2012. The problem is the scope of where we need to be investing, especially to remain under 1.5 degrees C, is $5,250 billion. It's like 9x of where that needs to be. Um, And so there, you as a company, um, especially if you work at a larger company, they have a lot of financial power. And so one of the best places to start is how can you as a company, especially if it's a big company, work to internally pressure and understand and disclose where the company is banking. There still aren't great commercial banking services, especially for very large companies um, that don't 
take some of those assets and then loan them out to fossil fuel companies. Um, as a very large company and a very large customer of their of theirs, there's a lot of pressure that could be put forward there. Um, the second thing here is that climate-friendly retirement plans and investment opportunities, these should be a default um, at the company. If you are a company who's truly aligned with solving climate change, obviously people should have choice in this matter. This should not be forced, but it should be a default. If someone says, if they don't go through the process of deciding which 401k plan they want, the default should be the climate-friendly option. And then the third part here is for insurance companies. These companies will, uh, major companies buy a lot of insurance. And so how can they apply the same pressure that they're applying to banks to their insurance partners to not insure fossil fuel uh, projects? Because that puts their insurance, the insurance that maybe the workers' comp insurance that Google is buying could be at risk because if their insurance partner has to start laying out massive insurance claims to fossil fuel companies, because of the devastation and the things like sea level rise and all of that that's coming, um, that could really just endanger that insurance policy in general. Um, Just also want to do a quick shout out. It was so cool to see Carbon Collective on this page. Okay, this is something that has been starting um, and it's really cool to see, which is climate disclosures. We need um, every, especially publicly traded, but the more privately traded companies we can get, there are some very large ones to disclose their climate related risks and also what their carbon emissions are and use verified third party sources for this. This allows investors like us, but also employees and activists to see exactly what's going on because classically, what gets measured gets managed. You can't fix something that isn't measured. Climate policy and advocacy. So companies spend an absurd amount of money in Washington, it sucks but it's a reality. And so how can that company make sure, your company, to make sure that it's using its financial and social power to advocate for climate policy at every level of government? So align those political contributions with solving climate change, not spreading them around evenly, um, not having them go to uh, uh, people who are more in, in the pocket of the fossil not having them go to politicians who are more in the pocket of fossil fuel companies um, and making sure and instead diverting those to focusing on climate solutions. How can these companies be climate heroes in a system that has way too much money in it? Regardless, let's use the tools that we have available. Now we're getting a little bit out there and this is for true business model transformation. So it depends on what your company is doing, but how can you as a company embed climate considerations into every part of your business? Because climate is changes here and it's going to get worse. That is going to happen. The degree to how much worse it gets is really up to us. Um, and so as a company, you are trying to protect yourself against risk and also be in a position to take advantage um, and offer your businesses and services in a way that will help us get out of this mess. So how can you embed those climate considerations into every part of your business? Um, and so this means that you're taking, again, that sustainability team is distributed throughout your business. There's sustainability person in every single department so that you're working to uh, reduce those emissions and probably also save a lot of money at the same time. Um, and similarly, on top of that, how do you prioritize climate solutions, um, even when it requires that upfront investment of resources or when it's difficult, uh, especially for publicly traded companies that are off operating on these short time windows? Um, how can they, how can you get ahead of this? Go 100% solar, switch to 100% EV fleet, invest that money now, knowing that you're going to have those returns later and letting investors like us reward you for it. The final piece here, and this is super important to think about, is that extractive capitalism got us into the mess of climate change. And our economy still runs on extractive capitalism. So as we think of the long term for you as an employee and for your company, um, how is your company going to fit into a world where we are truly facing extractive, extractive capitalism and asking those questions of, what is sustainability? What is a truly sustainable economic model? And how does your, is your company helping foster that? Or is it helping slow that down? Overall, this is a really important report that whether you are an employee or you are an investor like us, these are the things that we want to be in that position to push. Um, These eight categories of how can major corporations, which they are these large entities that are 
very strategically organizing resources in terms of raw materials, in terms of human resources, and capital, um, and political capital. How can we pressure these companies to be using these resources? Because it's a single leverage point to be using these resources to push for the exact type of change when it comes to climate change that we need. So we could be able to turn off that tap and start unplugging the drains as quickly as possible. And if you're an investor with Carbon Collective and one of our members, these are the eight principles that we use and looking at companies on how can we pressure them as investors. This has been a largely unused tool that we have as activists in this space to, as their investors, pressure and hold these companies accountable because we, especially publicly traded companies, we are their owners. And that means that we own both the bad and the good of what they're doing. And so as their owners and potentially you could argue their stewards, how can we push them to be the best stewards that they can for all of us and hold them accountable when they fall short? So thanks so much for watching. If you want to learn more, go check out Drawdown, Climate Solutions at Work, um, and also carboncollective.co, where you can invest in a way that's aligned with pushing co major companies um, to do these eight changes.